desperate to see the kingdom of God break into our lives. We cry out to you with all the Well, this week in Lifeline, we're looking at the Lord's Prayer. And I love the name, the Lord's Prayer. Some people call this the model prayer or the disciple's prayer. But I personally like the name, the Lord's Prayer, because we have to remember that Jesus lived a lifestyle of prayer. And uh, the disciples watched him. They had watched him pray. It was part of his lifestyle. It was part of his daily practice. And Jesus would go alone to pray. He would, ex he would spend extended times in prayer. So they wanted to know about his prayer life. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And when they asked him, teach us to pray, they weren't necessarily saying, teach us to pray for us. We understand that's different than how you pray. Because we remember, even though Jesus is God, he's also fully human. And as a human being, he lived in absolute dependence upon God, upon the Father. And uh, Philippians chapter 2 says that, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, and yet he humbled himself. He became a servant. He made himself of no reputation. And so we have to remember that in Jesus living a lifestyle of dependency upon God. Yes, he was without sin, and that's what qualifies him to be our Savior. And yet he came in human weakness. Uh, in Hebrews, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, that we have a compassionate high priest, that he he can sympathize with our weaknesses. In all points, he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. And in chapter 5, he says that in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And so, we understand Jesus prayed, but he prayed in, with vehement cries and tears. There was a sense of, of dependency in human weakness. So Jesus understands what it's like to be without, to suffer lack. And so we have to understand that when we come and look at the Lord's Prayer. Now in the Lord's Prayer, he, he teaches us that God is Father, that Jesus called God Father. And yet he teaches us also to call God Father. This is a, a very New Testament concept. There, is, there are places in the Old Testament where uh, Israel thought of God collectively as the father of the nation. He was their father. But this notion of intimacy with God, seeing God as a father personally, having a personal relationship with God, this is clearly uh, part of the New Covenant, something that Jesus reveals and teaches to his disciples. And, of course, it has to do with the new birth. So Jesus is teaching them to, to understand that God is your Father, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And this understanding of the name, the people of Israel, they, they hesitated to say the name of God. But the name represents more than just what we call somebody. A name represents someone's character, represents someone's person. And so Jesus is teaching us that when we pray and we talk to God, we have to understand who He is that his character is different than ours. His character is holy. Holy is your character. This is who you are. And so we're addressing somebody, we're talking somebody who is holy. And he teaches us to put the holiness of God first. We see that before we ask anything, before we petition God for a single thing, we need to worship him. Hallowed be your name is, is language of worship. We're not asking God yet for anything. Many times we come in prayer and we just we have our prayer list and we just launch into our laundry list of things that we want God to answer. And yet those prayers can be just anxiety laden prayers. And it's like they hit the ceiling and fall down and we say, what's wrong? How come I just don't seem to have a breakthrough in prayer? Well, worship is a key to effective prayer. And Jesus teaches us that at the very outset in the Lord's Prayer. He says, if you, want to, if you want to have effective prayer, first of all, you have to have intimacy with God. You have to have an intimate relationship with God as Father, understand your identity as a son. Secondly, you have to worship Him for who He is. Don't begin asking Him for anything until first you've begun to worship Him and adore Him. 
Now the Lord's Prayer is one of the most commonly memorized passages of scriptures. When my son was four years old, he so surprised me by his ability to memorize the Lord's Prayer. And uh, we used to let him watch the Jesus video a lot. He loved it. And um, he had memorized the names of the 12 disciples and the Lord's Prayer. And he could recite passages of scripture that really surprised me. But this is a very common passage of scripture to memorize, of course. And in many churches, people recite the Lord's Prayer as part of the worship service. However, we need to really realize that the Lord's Prayer was never probably intended by Jesus to be part of a, a ritual or some kind of just formality that we recite and we memorize. It's not something that we're meant to say is just a mantra or just some kind of you know, thing we, we just repeat over and over again. Remember Jesus said that uh, we're not to be like the heathen who by their vain repetition think that their many prayers will make them heard by God. And so it's possible that we could you know, be praying something like this and not really thinking about what it means. I think the whole point of Jesus teaching us this model prayer is that it is a model prayer. It's meant as more of a template. You know, in a computer we have many times, there you will have, for example, an Excel file. Well, the, the, the program is a template to be filled in. This Lord's Prayer is like that. It's, it's, it's more of a template, and I think that one of the keys is not to rush through the prayer when you're praying it, but to pray it with meditation. We need to really think about what we're praying and fill it in. It's a form that has to be filled out. Uh, you know, make it personal. So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean practically in our life? I believe that there's no postponement of the kingdom of heaven. I believe that from the time Jesus came until today, the kingdom of God has come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ and has been steadily increasing through his church. So I don't subscribe to some kind of postponement theology that says the kingdom was somehow postponed because the Bible says the kingdom of God is like a seed that's planted in the ground and it, you don't see it at first. It starts very small like a mustard seed, but later Jesus said it becomes the greatest of all the plants. So there is an increase of his kingdom that happens wherever his kingdom comes. We are to pray in that way. We're to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come in my life today. Let there be an increase of your kingdom. Let there be a manifestation of your kingdom. And that's something very personal. You have to believe in the supernatural power of God for that to be a reality because the kingdom coming is the invasion of heaven to earth and it wants to happen on a very personal level. So Jesus is teaching us not to pray for some future event that will happen in some age to come. We say, let your kingdom come now. It comes in hidden form, just as Jesus came in the disguise of humility, as his humility is real, but the kingdom was hidden from those who didn't have eyes to see it. And so he teaches us to identify with his kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Notice that he, he teaches us to pray, not first for our own needs. We don't pray for our daily needs until first we've prayed for God, heaven's will to be done. We pray, God, let your kingdom come. I want to put the kingdom of God first. It's what Jesus taught us in Matthew 6.33, to pray uh, that you know, we would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to us. That's why I do believe there is a, there's a progression here that is intentional. Jesus laid out a model prayer that there is a priority in prayer. And if you don't follow that priority in prayer, many times our motives get off. Or it's like something else has to be prayed first and then we're ready to pray for our daily needs, our daily bread. I believe that daily bread means two things. I think it means our daily needs our food, our clothing, our shelter. Jesus said, your Father knows you need these things before you ask. But there is an asking. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. I think the key is, not to, it's not that we don't ask, but that we ask in faith, understanding that God knows what we need and He, he, he already knows what we need before we ask. Nevertheless, He teaches us, ask and you shall receive. So there is to be this relationship, this dialogue, this communication with heaven. Secondly, though, I believe that there's a, there's a deeper spiritual aspect to daily bread and that it speaks of the manna that the children of Israel ate in the wilderness. Remember, Jesus said that He is the manna that came down from heaven. 
And so when he talks about daily bread, ultimately we have to realize that what sustains us is not the material provisions, which God says he will provide, but it is Jesus himself. Give me Jesus every day. If you try to make it through your week, you know, without Jesus, and you're going to just, I can't wait till Sunday, I'm going to worship. And if all you're doing is giving the Lord a tithe of your week, that's no way to live. Daily bread means you have a daily encounter with Jesus Christ. And so I believe that's what he, there's, there's a very specific intentional meaning Jesus is saying because if we take everything he said together about daily bread, and we understand daily bread does refer to the manna in the wilderness because it was daily bread. They literally depended upon the daily bread from heaven. Otherwise, there's no food out there in the wilderness. Well, Jesus is saying, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And then finally, we see two last things. The forgiveness of sins. Jesus taught his disciples, forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now, I believe this is one of the reasons why uh, people say, they, they would say, well, this isn't the Lord's Prayer, this is the disciples' prayer, because Jesus can't pray this prayer. But if you look a little closer at it, He didn't say, forgive me for my sins, which, of course, Jesus couldn't pray that because He's sinless. But He said, forgive us for our sins. What we see is an identification of Jesus with sinful mankind. He had no sin and yet he identifies with us so completely even in his sinless perfection as a human being he said forgive us for our sins he's praying to the father for, to forgive the sins of mankind and he fully identifies with mankind by by including himself even though he's sinless now to really understand this we have to see again in hebrews 5 where it talks about the role of a high priest and that the high priest he would offer up a sacrifice, not only for the sins of the people, but also for himself. Now, of course, we know Jesus is sinless, and the offering had to be a sinless lamb. So Jesus is the lamb, he's sinless, but he's also the high priest in that he's human. So this, this role of the high priest means a perfect identification with the people that the high priest is interceding for. So there is this intercessory role of Jesus in praying for the forgiveness of the sins of mankind, which he ultimately did on the cross. Remember, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was praying as a sinless human being, offering himself as the Lamb of God. Here he's praying as our high priest, forgive us our sins, even though he's sinless. So, beautiful picture of Christ's intimate identification with fallen humanity. How awesome. Jesus really means it when he says that he's our bridegroom and, and we are his brides. And then finally we see he teaches us to pray, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And of course, we know God doesn't tempt anyone, and that's not what Jesus is teaching us. It's more about, Father, protect us from temptation. You know, lead us in a way that would avoid temptation. And, the, and this is something Jesus could pray and did pray, because the Bible tells us He was tempted in all aspects, like we are, yet without sin. And so, Jesus... We, we think, well, he was God, so he was somehow just immune from temptation. No, the Bible says he was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. And so the temptation was a real temptation. And so Jesus prayed. What kind of things was he praying? We can see through the Lord's Prayer what kind of things he was praying and how he prayed. His prayer life. We see Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life, but it wasn't like he was just on automatic pilot. He did the daily disciplines of dependency upon God. And so that's why the disciples asked him, teach us to pray because we want to be like you. And obviously your prayer life has something to do with the way you live and the way you are. Yes, granted, Jesus had an advantage and yet in that he had no sin, he had never sinned, and yet he did this work in intercession. He prayed, he had a lifestyle of prayer, and he gives us a glimpse into his own prayer life by giving us this model prayer. And so, as we look at this prayer, we need to, we need to understand it's not just something to recite, it's not a ritual, it's a, it's a lifestyle to be lived out. 
And so there's an order and a progression. As we pray the prayer of Jesus, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer as well, we need to expect that there is going to be a conformity to the character and life of Jesus Christ.